text me or uh, at least monitor that and we can follow up with them a little bit later. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. Yep. All right, so uh, it's 1030, let's uh, go ahead and begin. Welcome everyone. Uh, this is our first uh, CCSW Disciples Connect webinar or conversation, whatever you want to call these, broadcast. Uh, I'll be playing uh, the role of Oprah. And uh, my host today uh, are two people that I uh, value their friendship. I value uh, them as colleagues, as ministers, uh, and I value the work that they do with the Christian Church Foundation. Uh, Bobby Holly is, uh, and, and Marilyn Fidmont, reverends. Bobby Holly and Marilyn Fidmont are uh, vice presidents with uh, Christian Church Foundation. And our role and our goal in these uh, CPSW Disciples Connect conversations is to let uh, general ministry partners that the church ought to know about uh, talk about what they do and how they can be of service to the church. Uh, so I'm not going to try to give a, a long introduction of uh, these two people. Uh, they promised me they would be on their best behavior. And so with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Marilyn and Bobby and let you all say welcome. And uh, you've prepared some, some conversation points, so we'll uh, launch the PowerPoint here when you're ready for it. Great, thank you, Andy. On, on behalf of, of myself and, and Marilyn and, and all of the Christian Church Foundation, it's good to be with you today. We appreciate this opportunity. Our, our goal is simply to, to give uh, those that may not be familiar with the Christian Church Foundation an, an introduction to who we are and what we do, what, what, what the goal of our ministry is, and, and how we can partner with those throughout the life of the church. Uh, Andy already said, I'm Bobby Hawley. I'm based in Fort Worth, Texas, and, and serve the South Central Zone of, of the foundation. Marilyn lives and offices in, in Houston and serves the Southwest Zone, which includes uh, New Mexico, Arizona, Pacific Southwest, and she also has the Northeast Zone. So a uh, little kind of bi-coastal thing going on there with Maryland. But we are, we are delighted. And the fact that Maryland has lived for a long, long time in Houston, um, she works with some of the congregations down in that area as well. And she and I work closely together in serving the Coastal Plains area. Um, as simply put, as I know how to say it, the, the mission of the Christian Church Foundation is to work with members of our church to promote the establishment and growth of permanent endowment funds that will support and sustain ministry in perpetuity. So what does that mean and how do we do it? We work with, with individuals and families to do inheritance and gift planning we work with congregations as well as other regional and general church ministries and, and regional ministries, Juliet Fowler Homes, Inman Christian Center, Southwest Good Samaritan Ministries, general church ministries like Global Ministries, Week of Compassion, and, and all of the others. And, and we work with them to establish effective permanent fund policies. Thirdly, we work with uh, entities to provide efficient and effective and prudent endowment fund fund management. And lastly, uh, somewhat sadly, but it, it's a reality in the world in which we live, some congregations um, outlive their their lifespan. They make a decision that they can't they are no longer viable. And so we work with congregations to provide uh, to plan for a permanent legacy, when they need to close their visible ministry. So those are really kind of the, the, an overview, the four highlights of, of what we do um, in working with, with individuals and working with congregations and other ministries in the life of the church. And, and Marilyn and I will touch on each of those uh, four phases of our ministry uh, over the course of the next few minutes here. First of all, to talk about the establishment and growth of permanent funds, many individuals, um, create permanent endowment funds through direct gifts to the Christian Church Foundation. They can do that through a, a variety of ways, lifetime gifts, um, bequests from the, by will or by trust, charitable remainder trust, a, a variety of types of assets can be transferred to us. But the ultimate goal is to create a named permanent endowment fund and the donor creates a permanent fund gift agreement that directs us, the Christian Church Foundation, 
to whom we make the distributions on an annual basis based on the donor's intent, the donor's instructions, and the donor's guidance. And we honor those as if we, we, we take that as a sacred responsibility and honor those instructions from the donors. I guess the next couple of things that, that I wanna say, I'm gonna kind of scroll the, through these fairly quickly is, yes, we manage a lot of money at the Christian Church Foundation. Currently, the Christian Church Foundation has somewhere north of $950 million under management. But our goal is to use those resources that have been entrusted to us to further the mission and ministry of the church. It's summed up in a quote by our president, Gary Kidwell, who said, our goal is moving money to mission. That, that's just what we do. We wanna use the resources that are entrusted to us by donors to make mission and ministry in the life of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ possible. Hey, Bobby, can we, I interrupt you for a second? A, absolutely. Can you can give us one specific example of what that might look like? Just just give us a scenario, or Marilyn, give us a scenario of what of what um, you know, what a what a donation from a local congregation's perspective. What what might that look like for them? Marilyn, you want to jump in? Yes, thank you, Andy. Good question. One of the things that congregations oftentimes consider uh, is what their whole, what the entirety of their assets. And so they may have some funds that have been sitting in a local account. They're not making much and they realize that they have a real passion for outreach. We have congregations who create funds that really, that when they take um, a certain distribution rate, they use those for their outreach purposes. And so it, it's not only to undergird a particular operating budget, but sometimes it's a specific entity or, or ministry within the life of their community, within the life of the church. So they, they, they figure out what is the best use of these dollars, because the dollars ultimately should if, impact lives, and they, and they figure out how to do that. So it may be to create a special fund for, for local church outreach or for a week of compassion, but it's a, mat, a matter of getting those funds moved beyond just um, what they would think of would be their their typical capacity. Right. So, so we have Bethany Christian Church down in Houston. I believe that they set up uh, a fund that would benefit Week of Compassion every year. And so the way that would work, as I understood it, they raised, uh, I want to say $50,000 uh, that they invested in Christian Church Foundation. And then they don't draw out of that $50,000 each year, but rather they take a draw from the interest earned or the the the, the, the earnings of that each year and that's that's part of what they give to week of compassion every year is that a fairly typical example of a church uh, setting up this kind of foundation I, I think that's right Andy there are there are a lot of, of congregations that you know week of compassion is, is promoted a program called I think it's circle of compassion is that right and, that sounds right. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's a minimum of $10,000 and, and it's invested with the Christian Church Foundation. And then, as you said, the, the earnings from that every year go to um, back to Week of Compassion's operating budget, not the corpus, but the earnings every year. Mm -hmm. Individuals can do a circle of compassion uh, gift for a permanent fund for only $1,000. We have that kind of partnership with a lot of general ministries, uh, Disciples Men, Disciples Women, Black Endowment Fund, uh, a number of different entities where an individual or a congregation can set up a named permanent fund specifically for that ministry. Mm -hmm. But an individual can also set up a named permanent fund, create a permanent fund gift agreement, and then name who they want the beneficiaries to be. So that could be their church's food pantry or um, their, their uh, uh, outreach department and, and the local ministries that they give to in the... Or who the, knows, it could be to, to benefit the region. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Wouldn't thank that you. be great? <laughs> I'd yeah, love it. Know, so. Yeah, sure. Okay. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry. I just wanted to... No, no, no. Uh, that, it that's helpful. to think in specific uh, examples. So that's great. Absolutely. And, and we'll get into a little bit more of that as we go along. Marilyn is, is going to focus on on permanent fund policies in a little bit. And, and, and so that will get into to some of that as well. 
Okay. I guess the other thing I want to say while we're on this topic of, of kind of moving money to mission in, in two slides down the road here, skip over the next one. I, I just gave in, in the past comments, I, I said an individual can set up a named endowment fund for only $1,000. You know, I use this illustration of, of the mustard seed um, because our focus, a, a lot of people think that you, you've got to be ex, extremely wealthy to be a philanthropist, to, to make an estate gift or, a, or an endowment fund. We don't think that at all. You don't have to be extremely wealthy. You just have to be exceedingly generous. You have to be committed to generosity. And, and frankly, we think that is true of most people within the life of the church. So we and our partner ministries have intentionally set the minimums fairly low in order for people to be able to do that. In order to start a named endowment fund at the Christian Church Foundation, it only requires a $1,000 minimum. In order to start making distributions from that fund, it requires $10,000. Um, so again, and a $1,000 fund or even a $10,000 fund distributing 4% is not going to distribute much. But when that's accumulated along with hundreds and thousands of other donors across the life of our church, it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. It makes a big difference. So, so that's why we do that. We, we truly believe that asking people for money is about giving them permission, giving them the opportunity to participate in building up the kingdom. Um, it, it's just that simple. Stewardship, including stewardship of accumulated resources, our, our legacy giving is part of our responsibility, is part of our, our discipline as faithful Christians. But specifically, when you're talking about stewardship, we don't just talk about at the Christian Church Foundation, stewardship as it pertains to one's giving to the operating budget in their congregation. Um, but we specifically talk about planned giving. While it's not always the case, but oftentimes planned gifts require considerably more thought and preparation and planning than what goes into deciding how much you're gonna to pledge to your congregation's annual fund. Sometimes people give from um, their brokerage accounts and, and they wanna be tax smart about how to do that most efficiently. So they wanna consult with a broker or, or an accountant. Sometimes people use land or real estate. And so they want to they want to determine the most effective way to do that. For some people, it involves charitable gift annuities or charitable trust, things that require more thought and planning than what usually goes into a gift. So that's one of the differences of, about what we do at the Christian Church Foundation. Next, I want to really just focus on the, the various ways that people can give. As I was just beginning to describe just now, some of it can be more complex, if you will, depending on the size of someone's estate, the, their complexity of their assets. Uh, but sometimes it, it's not. Sometimes it's fairly simple. People want to make a $10,000 cash gift from their accumulated assets, savings, a brokerage account. Maybe they want to transfer stock. You can give now to create a named permanent fund or to create a donor advised fund. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about what that is, but, but it's one of the vehicles or instruments that is used for, for gifting assets. Um, I've got up here on, on the slide, QCD, Qualified Charitable Distribution from an IRA is an extremely important and helpful tool that the IRS now allows people that are 70 and a half or older to distribute as much as $100,000 a year to charity as part of their uh, required minimum distribution and, and not pay taxes on it. So it's an efficient way that a lot of people have begun making gifts 
uh, to permanent funds or directly to their congregations. Again, they could give it to the region. They could give it to a variety of, of charities or ministries that they want to support. Give later, people can. Uh, one of the things, primary things that we frankly promote is uh, legacy giving through um, end of life gifts to put plans in place now so that at your death, either through will or trust or beneficiary designation, the gifts that you want to make will flow directly to the Christian Church Foundation or to your congregation or whatever, the, whatever ministries you want to benefit. There are a couple of different uh, gift instruments that I'm not going to go in again into detail to describe that we we talk we describe as as give now and give later. Charitable gift annuities and charitable remainder trust are ways in which you can fully irrevocably gift an asset through the Christian Church Foundation, but you retain a lifetime interest or income from that gift annuity or from that trust. And then at your death or at the death of the donors, if it's a husband and wife, uh, at the death of the second to die, then the remainder or residual of that gift will flow to charity. So you make the gift, but you retain an income interest in it for your lifetime. And then at your death, the residual goes to charity. So those are some Probably important, yeah, jump yeah. in, Mary. I just, I just wanted to interject with that. Oftentimes there's a considerable uh, tax benefit for doing that. Not only is it to create an income stream, oftentimes you need the additional income, but it also may serve as a real uh, tax benefit for those donors that highly appreciated assets that uh, doing those recreates the income stream, increases the benefit to the uh, charity after a lifetime. And it's, it's a win-win, shall we say. <laughs> Thanks, Bobby. Yeah, no, that's that's really important. Thanks for jumping in, Marilyn. I, I, I'm trying to to kind of talk fast and cover as much material as we can in, in a relatively short period of time. And I think what you said is is extremely important, Andy. What you said in your introduction, Marilyn and I are both ordained ministers. Our goal is to preach and teach about the stewardship of accumulated resources. So technically, we don't give tax advice or legal advice but we're also gift planners. And so we, we work with donors to plan the most efficient way to make a gift. The way and that would say, benefit. Just, just as an interjection of testimony, uh, both with the two of you and with others from foundation that I've worked with, I've always had, both as a local church pastor and as regional minister, I have always had the experience of believing and experiencing that I was communicating with a ministry first and asset managers second. Uh, that has always been the the thing I have said about foundation and the things I've said to foundation. Uh, I so appreciate the fact that um, that's not just a, a slogan that's on a plaque somewhere. That has been lived out time and time and time again in my conversations with the two of you and, and with others. So encourage other people to to you know interact with you as well uh, as they're trying to make uh, sense out of their church's resources and and how to be good stewards of that. Um, I just find the two of you great conversation partners for that work. Great. Thank you. Uh, I, I guess the last thing I want to say kind of in, in this section of my presentation that I'm going to turn it over to Marilyn in, in just a minute is um, you can go on to that next one. The, the, um, as I said in my opening remarks, I'm based in Fort Worth and my territory, if you will, covers all of Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Maryland's based out of Houston and she covers a, a wide territory, New Mexico, Arizona, Pacific Southwest, and New York and, and, and the Northeast region. We cannot be in every congregation as much as we would like. We try to be as responsive both, both by phone and email and, and other forms of, of social media to, to our donors and our ministers as we can. And we try to visit as often as we can. But the reality is to truly promote inheritance or, or legacy giving within a congregation requires the commitment of the pastor and of committed lay leaders. So a number of years ago, we, we came to this realization that we can't be all things to all people, and we can't be everywhere all the time. 
So we created this, this program, if you will, that we call the mentoring model. And it's a relationship based way for congregations to invite and encourage individuals within your congregation to plan for a legacy, an end of life gift to benefit the congregation. It, it is a program in which lay leaders who are willing to say, I've included the church in my estate plan and I hope you will as also. At no point in the program does it does anyone tell anyone else how much they should give or when they should give or how should they give, but it simply encourages people to include the church in a legacy gift plan. So I'm not gonna go into a lot more detail about that other than to say we have resources about that. And Marilyn and I, and, and as you said, Andy, our other colleagues across the life of the church are available to work with, with pastors and lay leaders to help launch this kind of a program within a, within a local church. The next slide goes into a little bit of detail about it, but um, that, that's really the gist of what this does. It, it helps put the responsibility within the local leaders to, to ask for gifts, to promote the program and, and to encourage follow-up. The, the thing I want to, I'm going to pass the torch, so to speak, to, to Marilyn now. One of the things that, that we really talk about is if we do our job well and we work with congregations and lay leaders, pastors, to encourage the growth of, of gifts, then congregations will begin to receive wills, uh, bequests, and, and legacy gifts. So what do you do next? Marilyn? Thank you, Bobby. Uh, one, of the, one of the major things that we talk about is what happens with the first big gift. We typically say within the life of the Christian Church Foundation, every congregation stands to receive a gift from uh, an estate, uh, maybe a gift during lifetime that is unexpected. And you have some options with what you will do with that first gift. One is that you can have the biggest church fight you've ever had. Uh, it, you, you really can. This can be worse than a family feud. You can spend it. Often congregations will say, finally, we have the resources to pay off, to do this, to do that, to, to buy something. You can deposit it in a CD with the local bank and, and get that uh, robust uh, $2 or so a month, uh, whatever it might be. Or better yet, you can have a policy in place that will direct that gift. And we always advocate, have the policy ahead of time so you know exactly what's going to happen when you receive that gift. You will know how it's going to be invested, you will know the distribution, and you'll know how to report it to the congregation or to the donor. And one of the things we always advocate is find those numerous ways to th say thank you for that gift. But a policy is one of the critical issues in, in starting that process. So you don't have to worry about that church fight. So we're gonna go on to the next one. We have available, as Bobby has mentioned, we have available some various samples of a permanent fund policy. One of the critical things is to say, what is the purpose of the fund? What is it designed to do? Uh, we have some language and, and this can be, it serves as a model for, your, for the congregation but you can enhance that or tweak that based on what the needs of the church may be. So you wanna say what the purpose is. Why do we have this fund in the first place? What is it designed to do? The next one on, on the permanent fund policy, the model, model policy, what type of gifts? What is the congregation willing to receive and what is it not willing to receive? You think that, oh yeah, we take everything. You may not want to. Oftentimes, particularly in, in cases of real estate, I, I've known a congregation here in the Houston area that received a sliver of land that is near our, our large airport, IAH, and they will never be able to do anything but pay taxes on it. So we, we advocate, think about what type of gifts you wanna receive uh, and, and, and what you can do with those gifts. Have endowment trustees. We talk about the role of those trustees. 
what they're responsible to do, uh, how they report back to the congregation. And annual spending for ministry, oftentimes we refer to the JIT rate, and that is established by Christian Church Foundation, established at a rate that is designed to, um, to reinvent that so we may make more than, than what you dis, what we just you will want to distribute. So in other words, your corpus of your fund continues to grow. So so you take a specific rate, you know what that's going to be. You 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 try not to go over that so your fund will continue to grow. Amending procedures. One of the things that you want to have in place is a is periodically you look at a policy. A, a, you don't do this every year, but you do want to periodically review your policy and see uh, if there's something that needs to be changed or amended. And finally, the termination component to the permanent fund policy. And that oftentimes happens if a congregation does come to the end of life, they have funds invested with us. Uh, and what will happen to those funds if the congregation ceases its visible ministry? That's Marilyn, along the, those lines, so so to give us an example of this, if if a congregation had say a hundred thousand uh, dollar endowment or or a foundation, um, their annual spending for ministry might be with your advice is a four percent draw, correct? Mm -hmm. Because that is correct. On it's average, that's going to grow by seven percent on average over a course of time, and so this allows the corpus to grow and provide annual money for ministry. So on $100,000, that would be a $4,000 annual draw, roughly, mm -hmm. that the congregation would then direct according to its values and according to the policies it's set up in this with foundation. It, it's determined how you're going to spend that money um, and how you're not going to spend that money. And then on the termination of the, of the, uh, of the fund or the or the congregation, um, I know from just our experience in the last three years that a when a church sells its building, the those monies have to be entrusted to another nonprofit. They have to be distributed uh, to another nonprofit. Is the same um, restrictions on a um, on a on a permanent uh, fund of this nature? Are those uh, those fund monies, when, when if, the, if the congregation concludes its visible ministry, is it uh, are those funds need to be distributed to a nonprofit at that point? Andy, we've had that question come up, and here's what I've discovered with the congregations I've worked with, particularly in the Pacific Southwest region. Um, they already had funds with us, and so it was an easy walk from having those in what um, that it was an easy walk to transfer those into a named permanent fund. A late, they became a legacy congregation. One congregation had uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars invested. So they changed that from a fund that they owned and, and placed it into a, leg, a permanent fund with Christian Church Foundation. It became their legacy fund. That was a pretty easy walk for them. Others may do something a little different. Bobby may have a different story, but for the ones I've worked with as they were closing, it was an easy shift to becoming a legacy permanent fund. Bobby? Well, yeah, I, th I think what Marilyn is saying is absolutely correct. But Andy, if I heard you correctly, you were asking a different question. You I'm asked sorry. if they sell their building, sell their property, or if they have funds invested at the Christian Ch Church Foundation, do those funds, do those assets have to be distributed to another charity or not-for-profit? And the, if that was your question, which I think it was, yeah, yeah. the answer to that is absolutely, right. because the funds, uh, the people who gave those funds to the church to begin with, got a tax deduction for them, and it was given to a church, a not-for-profit. The, the irony is, I, I met, I'm laughing, because I met with a, with a small congregation in, in Louisiana a long time ago, maybe 10 years ago, and it was sadly, like a lot of churches, it was going through the process of terminating its ministry. And I was sitting in the living room of, of a lady, a matriarch of that church, and there were eight or 10 other people in, in her living room sitting around visiting about the process that we're going to go through. And they wanted to just take the assets and divide it up among themselves. <laughs> After all, we're the members, aren't we? You can't do that. Can't do that. Best, you can't kind of take a dim view of that. <laughs> That's, so, and so Bobby, Bobby and I have been... were given for charitable purposes have okay. to be transferred over to another charity. 
Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be a church charity, frankly. We we hope that it would be right, right, right. because that's the way the people prior to them gave the money to build up a disciples church. So we at the at the Christian Church Foundation feel very strongly that those dollars ought to stay within the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Right. But some congregations upon closing distribute their assets or at least a part of their assets to local charities that they have supported and felt in partnership with over the years. Right. And so but what I'm hearing Marilyn say is they don't necessarily have to um, dissolve that and distribute the resources. They can set up a legacy fund, which would say a third of the dividends will go to their region. A third of their dividends will go to a uh, week of compassion. A third of their dividends would go to new church. Uh, and, and they could, they could, they could set the percentages that way. And, and Chris, which Christian Church foundation then execute those funds annually without there having to be a, you know one member who actually punches in the the, uh, the figures <laughs> exactly. that's absolutely correct it's a permanent yeah. fund gift agreement that continues mm -hmm. in perpetuity and while we want the vast majority of those distributions as i just said to stay within the christian church of disciples of christ they can include some non church related qualified charity as one of the beneficiaries of their sure. legacy fund. Mm -hmm. Habitat for Humanity. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. Habitat, a local food bank. Mm -hmm. We just have to vol verify its 501c3 status. Gotcha. As, Great. as Bobby is saying, oftentimes congregations, it, it is, a, thank you for including both perspectives in that, because one of the things that uh, some congregations are have done is they will go ahead with local uh, local charities that they've supported and and they have said this these are two years this is what we would send you for two years here it is now this is our last gift and oftentimes make those distributions before they formally close the doors and to let those ministries know that how much they've appreciated them and yet want to support them so it's kind of both and as bobby has, has, has said it is a little bit of both we literally have had meetings with folks who said can we divide this amongst ourselves and and Andy, Bobby, Orange will not be my my new black. It just <laughs> so we, just, <laughs> we discourage that at all costs. But but it is it it is much easier when these policies are in place. They already have funds with us. It which a lot of congregations when they get to the termination point, they have that, and so it's, it is a pretty simple process for us, unless some other unforeseen. Uh, activities or actions, but oftentimes it, it can be a pretty smooth transition. Okay. I'll stop interrupting you. Go ahead. No, you were fine. <laughs> One of the things we just talked about in our whole marketing uh, component is to say thanks. Find ways to tell people thank you, especially those folks who felt that they didn't, that they didn't have those enormous estates, but that thousand dollars, any gift I believe is sacred because it comes from someone's sincere belief of the gospel of the local congregation, particularly that has supported and sustained them. They may not want uh, a lot of, of, of uh, to do a lot of show about a gift. I worked with a donor who lovely man uh, sold a, a business and tithed his, his business sale and it's created a permanent fund with a substantial amount of money and wants to remain anonymous. That happens, but those folks, letters of appreciation, visits, et cetera, that's always important. Some congregations really do celebrate through All Saints Day or Epiphany, those folks who have left gifts to the life of the church, their permanent wall plaques, annual listing, any number of ways that someone's um, name is retained within the life of the church and with, amongst the same saints. Bobby, quick story. You know this one well. My my sister and brother in law in Kansas City, when my when their son, my nephew, passed away, created a scholarship fund, and one of the major reasons was to retain his name within the life of of the community. The scholarship fund is their way of saying our son still has a meaningful witness to others that who are coming along, and so it's just an excellent way to remember that there are people watching uh, watching those names and it's a way of saying thank you. We can never quite do that enough. Amen. Absolutely, absolutely. And and, and some people will say, uh, well, the person's already deceased. How can I thank them? You thank them in worship. 
even if it's just a brief sentence or two in connection with the stewardship moment. We've received a legacy gift from Mrs. Jones who passed away a few months ago. We wanna dedicate that in worship today. She may have family members sitting in the pews. Other potential donors may be watching how you do or don't show gratitude and appreciation for those kinds of gifts. So that, that's just important. Well, and I think that point that Marilyn made that, that these are these are sacred gifts. That's and right. So we are thanking the donors, but we're also thanking God when we do that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Expressing gratitude. And I will say one thing, uh, you know, these letters of appreciation, I have had terrible handwriting my entire life. And so self-conscious about writing those letters and cards of thanks in my own hand. And I heard a, a, a fairly generous giver talk about the fact that his pastor has very poor handwriting, but how meaningful it is that he gets that card written in his pastor's own hand saying thank you. And so I yeah. want to encourage our pastors to, uh, you know, I'm not good about it. And so, you know, it's a, it's a you know, statement to myself as well to, to write those thank yous, not just not just the letters, but also that handwritten card that says, uh, we appreciate you, so. Absolutely. I, I want to I want to make another kind of shift in our, in our conversation and talk about how it is that we manage endowment funds at the Christian Church Foundation. Mar Marilyn alluded to this earlier when she was talking about the distribution from permanent funds. Um, we, our goal is to earn approximately seven, seven and a half percent. We distribute four or four and a quarter percent. Um, and that way you're always putting money back into the corpus of the fund to mitigate the impact of inflation over time. Our twin goals, our investment philosophy is to always be distributing money to fund current ministries and retain a portion of the buying power of the dollar to mitigate the impact of inflation. That's just important. And that's the nature of a long-term strategy that's different than a savings account or, or other types of investments that an individual or a congregation might have. <clears throat> part of our um, investment strategy and part of our mandate, if you will, is, is governed by something called the prudent investor rule. And this slide that you have up there now has some bullet points. I'm just going to hit a couple of them. But the first one is really the most important. Sound diversification is fundamental and required of fiduciaries or, or trustees who manage these kinds of funds. Well, what does that mean? It means you should not take all of your assets and put them in CDs or, or bonds or fixed income. Now, that's not to say that you shouldn't have some fixed income as a part of your asset allocation. In the same way, you should not put 100% in aggressive growth stocks. There ought to be a level of diversification that helps mitigate some of the negative impact of fluctuations in the market over time. Um, you have a, a responsibility to avoid um, unnecessary and unjustified fees and expenses. Trustees must balance production of current income against the production of protection of purchasing power. That again is what I said about you spend enough to fund current ministry, but not so much that you're decreasing the corpus of the fund over time. The, the last bullet point there, trustees have a duty to delegate decisions as prudent investors would. You, you need to trust the, the advice and counsel of professional managers. And while you, and I appreciate the fact that you said earlier, Marilyn and I are, are both ordained ministers. We, we talk about what we do first as ministry, but that's not to say at the Christian Church Foundation, we have, for lack of a better term, a whole slew of accountants in the back office. We have six or eight accountants and we have a consulting firm that helps us do the due diligence of overseeing effectively, efficiently, and prudently 940 or $50 million in assets that we hold as a sacred responsibility. And, and it's tell, Go ahead, Marilyn. Oh, okay, Bobby, you may have it coming up, but one of the other things on the prudent investment rule um, and the trustees and their role and responsibility 
one of the things we always do advocate for is that there's not a conflict of interest. There are any number of times that I've had some congregations, there's someone who um, has enough connections that they, they may be with, a, with a, another invest, an investment firm, et cetera. And sometimes that can be really dicey, really tricky for a congregation when um, they use someone so heavily connected to the congregation, when things go sideways, shall we say, when the market does something, then, then they feel badly. It's, it's just one of those things where Christian Church Foundation is that, that honest broker, as we say, it's not someone who, who is so closely invested, embedded with the church that you end up with um, any conflict. Bobby, I'm sorry. I, I just... No, no, no. I think that's a great comment. And, and if I can just piggyback on that, you know, one of the things you just said, we're not as closely invested in the local congregation, and yet we are intimately our goals are aligned. We have our own endowment funds invested in the same funds that we encourage congregations to invest with us, invest with in our funds. So we have mutual interest and we have a sense of partnership with the whole church. Bobby and, and Marilyn, thank you. Within your own investment, the, the foundation's own investment philosophy, I would imagine that um, ethical investing uh, not investing in companies that, uh, you know, have a track record of abuse or, or you know, I'm not sure what the right language here is. Uh, but can you say a little bit about that from, from Foundation's perspective? Marilyn, you want to take that or you want me to? Yes, yes. Uh, one of the things, and, and we have become even, dare we say, our staff, particularly de development staff, we have, we are with ICCR, the, the, uh, and Bobby, sometimes I can't get it all right, but for corporate responsibility. And Interfaith Council on Council Corporate, corporate responsibility. responsibility. And, and, and if that, anybody wants more information about that, it, it's very simple to go to iccr.org. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, and Marilyn. One of the things that we do is uh, really, it allows us to be on point and up to speed. Our, our development staff has even gotten involved. We can, we can, uh, Look at some of the committees that deal with things about human trafficking, um, uh, arms, uh, Palestine, Palestinian, Israeli issues, any number of issues that we say we want to have good resources, we want to have good returns, but not on the backs and at the expense of humanity. Uh, one of the funds that we just created, the Bostic Select Fund, and you can go on the web and look at that fund. It, it has some things that it literally, it screens against uh, certain things. We vote proxies that Gary Kidwell has been involved in write, letter writing to corporations who are doing some things that um, have negative impacts. We take that very seriously. We don't want to have good returns and at the expense of the least among us. Bobby, go ahead. No, I appreciate that. So uh, there's two ways to do socially responsible investing. One is to, to try to have impact on the companies that you invest in by voting proxies. And as Marilyn said, letter writing and, and a, a, as a shareholder to try to influence the board and in, influence the company. We do that with all of our funds across the board through ICCR, Interfaith Committee on Corporate Responsibility. And then we created the, the Bostic Select Fund um, and, and it takes it a step further and takes a little bit of a different track. It is still uh, votes proxies on, on a lot of the, the shares that we own and, and those investments, but we also made a decision. And part of this came, uh, came about as a result of some input from some of our in, uh, current and potential investors. They said, we want a company that, uh, we want an investment fund that does not involve um, investment in fossil fuel industry. We want an investment fund that does not invest in the arms race, uh, national gun manufacturers. We want a investment fund that boycotts companies that contribute to the conflict between the Israelis and Palestinians. So the Bostic Select Fund basically excludes, it sets certain um, filters and excludes those companies in its investment protocol. Okay? okay. Is that helpful? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, the, the next slide really talks a, a lot about 
why a congregation would want to, a congregation or region or other ministry partner would want to invest with the Christian Church Foundation. And I'm going to just move on, Andy, for the sake of time. The next slide has a, has a lot of information in it. But, but what I want to say about this slide is that this reflects a commitment to a strategic investment discipline. We are not involved in, in um, trying to be involved in market timing, certainly not day trading, any of those kinds of things that you hear about. But we set a discipline of establishing a investment goals and strategies, return objectives, risk assessment. And from those bottom kind of tiered foundations, the risk assessment and the return objectives, then we create an, an asset allocation. Then we, based on our asset allocation, we select managers. And, and we do that in partnership with a consulting firm that helps us do manager searches. And then we monitor and oversee the, the performance of those, those uh, managers over time. A as you can see in the next several slides, um, and I'm not gonna go into each one of these, we can actually kind of flip through the next five slides fairly quickly, but, um, We've got five different funds that are available to, for congregations and other ministry partners like the region and other regional ministries uh, to invest their endowment funds in one of the one or more of these five funds. So, so the, the investor, the, the congregation or uh, the individual or the entity that's creating their own investment with foundation would choose which of these funds to, to put their money into? That, that's correct. Now, I want to correct one thing. You said that the congregation or the individual. Individuals cannot invest with the Christian Church Foundation. They can create named permanent funds, so it's an irrevocable gift. Okay. Congregations and other ministry partners like that have assets that have been gifted to them that then they can turn around and invest with us. Okay. Um, for individually named permanent funds, we normally, we have a default fund, which all of new permanent funds are gonna go into the Bostic Select Fund, unless a donor specifically knows about these five funds and says, no, I'd rather it go in the Common Balance Fund or I'd rather mm -hmm. it go in the Beasley Fund, then, then they, they can direct it. But the Bostic Fund is gonna be our default fund for all new individually named permanent funds. Gotcha. Congregations and other investing partners who are investing their assets with us choose which of these fund or funds they want to invest in. Okay. And some of that, Andy, uh, as you know, is based on their tolerance. There, there are some folks, as you look at these pie charts and how the, the funds are, are allocated, some of this is based on their tolerance. Some of us, uh, as, as Bobby mentioned with our Bostic fund, was a specific need and, and uh, request by uh, investors. But some of it is really based on with the long-term strategy, they're willing to say, okay, when the market is fabulous and the Beasley Fund is soaring, yes, that looks good. They're also sometimes willing yeah. to say 2008 comes along and, and we do a Maalox moment, shall we say. But yeah, part of it is based on what their tolerance are, what they feel their objectives are. Many congregations have money invested for different reasons and in, in more than one fund because they want it to do, they have those yeah. things they want to accomplish. Well, I could see, you know, for instance, you, you mentioned some of the commitments, the values, and I don't question those on the Bostic fund, but uh, but particularly around fossil fuels, that's that's a part of Texas economy. And so right. <laughs> yeah, that might be a place where we say, you know what, that's, that's not as, as important to us uh, we we're mm -hmm. we're we're going to invest with Beasley or Campbell or one of the other right. funds. And, mm -hmm. uh, so, mm -hmm. sure, mm -hmm. absolutely. Some of it is regionally based. Uh, uh, dare we say some of uh, some of my West Coast folks they are thrilled with the Boston fund, but yeah, Texas we know where, where our bread and butter comes from. Bob. But I, I I've been surprised about how many new investment accounts here in Texas and Oklahoma, which is also heavily invested in the oil industry. Uh, have moved assets into the Bostic Fund. So, um, yeah, yeah. but that's the right. value of, of being able to do this. As you look at the values that are undergirding those funds, and able to make choices based on your own values as well. That's right. That's exactly Great. right. Great. Yeah. Are we ready to move on? 
So yeah, the next slide really is just, it's based on our fund returns as of 1231 of 2020. So the end of last year, um, you know, you can see the one year ending in 1231, the common balance fund had a return of 10.8%, uh, the Beasley growth fund 11.5 and, and read on down there. And then you can look off to the right and see what the three, five and 10 year averages were. I met with a group of trustees recently and they were a little bit confused by that. So, so what is this Morningstar moderate fund? Well, the, the Morningstar many people are familiar with is kind of a benchmark by which we do comparisons to say, how are our funds performing in relation to the rest of the investment universe, if you will. So that Morningstar moderate fund is the one that's most closely align with the allocation in our common balance fund. The Morningstar growth fund is the one that's most commonly aligned with the Beasley and on down the list. So that's just for, for our viewers today to, to look at and, and consider uh, partly in terms of their planning strategy, but just to see um, while it's important to be, I think invested with the Christian Church Foundation because of our faith and because of our church partnership, we don't put returns um, as, a, as a secondary issue, if you will. We, we, our goal is to have a, as good a returns as you can find anywhere in the market. Thanks, that's helpful. Um, the, the last couple of slides, I'm gonna pass it back to Marilyn. And, and we've alluded to this earlier in our, in our conversation a time or two, but uh, talk a little bit about legacy congregations. Thank you, Bobby. A reality is this, not all congregations will continue their visible ministry other than our people, our folks who have been faithful and sat in those pews for numerous years. The other major assets we may have or whatever funds are still left in the church coffers and the church building. What happens when a congregation decides to close? One of the things I would advocate is do not just give it away. There are congregations, disciple churches who literally uh, had their final worship ser service and gave the keys of the church, turned it all, all over to another worshiping entity. And that's fine. It continues the gospel. But I would also make the case that those faithful disciples um, who spent years building and, and stewarding that, that community of faith, there's a way that that congregation can live on. And so we do that with our legacy congregations. One of the things, Andy, you would know this well, Bobby and I both do, is that uh, it's a delicate dance of, of helping the congregation make that decision. But also as we journey and walk with them is, is to make sure that we are available to them to help them make uh, good decisions. One of the things that is included in that is, is how vulnerable a congregation can be towards the end of its lifetime. Another group may come in, we call it steeplejacking, can come in and, and probably within a matter of months or, or a very short time period, virtually take over a congregation. It has happened and it is unfortunate. So we have some documents that we have. One of them is called a termination clause. We really encourage a congregation to have some things in place to protect their assets while they are making that decision. And they can partner with the region, our area, to make sure that they are, they are involved all along the way so that the church in a vulnerable position is not um, met with, dare we say, a takeover. What can happen then as the church goes through a closing process, we have, we have some resources to help make all those uh, decisions, what to do with some physical assets, uh, pianos and, and pews and, and Bibles, et cetera, that can be shared with others. And that process of creating a permanent fund a legacy fund gift agreement, where those things can be distributed, how that permanent fund will do, as we've talked about all through this, this meeting, can distribute to those ministries that the congregation has felt strongly about. Sometimes it, 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 it may be all to one particular entity, but oftentimes there are several things that a congregation has supported and they continue to support through the legacy uh, concept, the permanent fund legacy gift agreement. Marilyn, can I jump in and, and, sure. and make one other comment about, about closing congregations? I, I think one of the things that, that happens inevitably at the end of a congregation's lifetime is 
um, sometimes there becomes some, some anger and some contention. Um, there, there's a lot of grief over losing a congregation, over a congregation's death. And they, they blame the minister, they blame the region or the general church that we didn't do enough for them to help them. Why weren't you there when we needed you? Our role oftentimes that, that Marilyn and I and our other colleagues uh, play is to be pastors to them and listen, but then to also guide them. And, and we direct them to, to help make their legacy gift agreement in such a way that reflects their history. If they historically gave to, to Juliet Fowler Homes and, and Global Ministries and made a gift to the region every year, if the region helped fund the starting of that congregation, it would be appropriate to include the, the region in their, in their legacy gift agreement. But, but our, ultimately our role is, is to listen and, and help them sort that out. I, I oftentimes think, you know, we sometimes know why a congregation closes, the old changing neighborhood syndrome or, or um, a, a rural congregation in a small town that is literally the town itself is dying and, and the population is moving away. But some of you know my, my wife is, is a nurse and a nursing professor, and I learned the term about medicine called idiopathic. I love that word. I just think it's, it's funny. But sometimes that's true of, of congregations in, in, in their closing days. And, and all that means is really, we don't know. We cannot come up with an accurate diagnosis to know the cause of this disease. And that's sometimes true of churches. It is just part of their life cycle that they're going to die and they're going to close. So our role as, <clears throat> as pastors and as the foundation is, is to walk with them in that journey and to grieve with them when the time comes. The other thing that I've, I've experienced, and it's sitting there as, as uh, dare we say, not only as, as one of the pastors, but, but sitting a little further away from their history, is when we open those questions and they begin to tell their history and see the possibility of how that, that history is being birthed again with this legacy fund, it has been, it's, been amazing to me to see the joy that comes to know that even though they may not gather and some of them periodically gather as you know have a little reunion time annually but to know that they still have that resurrection that new life has come and uh when they get to sit and tell those stories and talk about well we can give something to week of compassion or to the region or to the campsite it it is a uh, revig reinvigorating for them that they do see that and and we and I'm I'm grateful that Christian Church Foundation is an avenue that can work along with our regional partners walk them through walk congregations through that process. Amen, Bobby uh, Marilyn, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we've been doing this for about an hour, and that's about a, as much as we can uh, uh, sustain. I suspect um, this is a lot of your time, and I really am grateful for it. Uh, I'm going to put the the um, uh, contact information up here on the screen real quick. Uh, you can reach uh, Bobby Holly at uh, bholly at ccf.disciples.org and Marilyn Fidmont at mfidmont at ccf.disciples.org. Um, you know, closing words, uh, Marilyn, you're you're muted on my uh, my end, friend. I'm so sorry. You have to take the T off the Fidmont. They 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 didn't give. There really is a T, but not for my email. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, take a T uh, off for me. <laughs> Fidmont. Thank you. Yeah, no team. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you. But yeah. uh, but uh, reach out to uh, these two great uh, folk if you are in um, those spaces. And I'm imagining that we might get a few people who are not uh, part of the Christian Church in the Southwest, uh, so not in New Mexico or not in Texas. Um, and so uh, they could call the, the the foundation itself and find out who is the Bobby or Marilyn in their neck of the woods. I'm sure. So. Uh, but again, thank you both very much. If it's okay, I'd like to conclude us in prayer. And you guys want to say some final, final words, but um, I'd like to close us in prayer. It has been a joy to be in ministry and partnership, not only with you, Andy and, and Bobby, but with the wonderful people and congregations we meet. It is yeah. great joy. Thank well, you, Andy. Yeah, thank you. God bless.
Loving God, we thank you for the work that you have entrusted to our hands. I thank you for these two faithful uh, stewards and servants of your church, for Marilyn, for Bobby, for their joy, uh, for the joy that they uh, have in friendship with one another and the ways in which uh, their friendship informs the, the collegiality in the life of our church, for the Christian Church Foundation, uh, for the ways in which it demonstrates faithful stewardship, ethical investment, uh, a vision for the future, and um, capacity to think about the present. Uh, we give you thanks. We pray that you watch over their ministries, watch over the Christian Church Foundation, and allow all of us uh, to work together for your glory. And what we do and say points to your grace. We love you, O God. We uh, place our lives in your hands. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care.